You want to build a campaign as unique as each customer. And to do that, you need to know who they are and how they're using your product. That's exactly what Amplitude's powerful behavioral insights can do for you. Now available within HubSpot's customer platform. With the updated Amplitude app for HubSpot, your marketing team can use product behaviors to identify the best leads to nurture, easily pass more qualified leads to sales, better welcome customers at sign up, see how email campaigns are performing, and work with service to reignite at-risk customers, all using Amplitude's curated, targeted data in the hubs you already love. Install the Amplitude app for HubSpot to get started today. Hi everyone, welcome to the session. What we just showed, <laughs> uh, my name is Karen Ng. I'm here with two incredible product leaders, Francois, who's the CPO of Amplitude, also the ex-CPO of Tableau, and Andy Petrie, EVP of UX and product at HubSpot. Hi everybody. Today we're excited to talk about unified data, PLG, how that drives growth, and how that drives revenue. Um, what you just saw with that video that played is Andy at the keynote yesterday announced that we have a deeper partnership with Amplitude. Um, Andy, why is it so important that we had this partnership now and what are companies looking at for driving growth? Uh, so for me, the answer to that question is when we think about HubSpot, we think about what we're trying to build at HubSpot and the product roadmap, we want to provide our customers, businesses with the most unified source of information about everything that their customers are doing. Uh, we want to make it easy to have all that information in one place, to make sense of that information all inside of HubSpot. And Amplitude obviously has incredible analytics data. Uh, we use it at HubSpot for product analytics, but I know it does more than just product analytics, but I always you know, think about it through that lens. Um, and so there's like incredible information that you're tracking about your customer behaviors inside of Amplitude. And it just makes sense to have that incorporated with all of the other customer data that you're tracking in HubSpot Smart CRM about your customers. And if I can add, I mean, today being customer centric is more critical than ever before. And so the more you know about your customers, the faster you can grow. And I think it's important to know, to think about the entire customer journey. And in this new world, you know, customer data comes from everywhere, right? Obviously you bring customers into your website, uh, but then they go into your product, and that's a rich source of information. And without that knowledge, uh, it really creates a big gap. Think about it from a marketing perspective. Are you driving the right campaigns to the right users? By being able to unlock that product data or that website data, you're going to be able to better target your users based on who they are and what they're doing. Or think about it for sales. You know, being able to do better lead scoring by using the product signals to help you target those most uh, powerful leads that can be converted. Same thing for customer success. The product usage data can help you know which customers are at risk and where you should have proactive action. And that combination that we have between the data that we have in HubSpot, the ability to take action in HubSpot, plus all the behavioral data that you have in Amplitude those two things really enable you to get deeper insights about your customers and ultimately drive that faster growth that's required in this highly competitive environment. Cool. Um, so they both mentioned unified, or we've been talking a lot about unified data and the importance of that. And you talked about a couple things in marketing, sales, and service. You know, really good data helps you drive action. Whether it's a marketer trying to understand how do you segment a cohort of users, sales understanding, how do I bring value and personalize almost. Um, talk to me a little bit about how do you know when you have missing data? How do you identify what's missing and how do you go from there? How do you get it? Well, I mean, I think you said it, right? Data without action to me is a missed opportunity, right? You have all of these rich signals from your customers that are coming from a variety of sources, your website, campaign data, social data, e-commerce data, product data, it's everywhere. And the more you have a complete picture of your customer, the better you can serve them, the better you can target them, the better you can engage with them to drive value. And oftentimes what we've seen, especially in the B2B world, where you have only half of the data, AKA you have some data about how you're targeting your users, uh, 
But when they're landing in your product that you're trying to sell to them, well, is that converting or not? And in many cases, one of the challenges that exists is that there is a breakdown between the various disciplines. Marketing is not connected to product, that's not connected to sales. Yeah. And the opportunity is to really connect the dots with everybody, to make sure that every single person is operating off of the same data, the same view of the customer, and doing that in this unified experience. That's really what becomes so critical. And again, unifying that data is the missing link that makes all of this possible. And I think, I think everybody has missing data, <clears throat> unfortunately. Uh, that's a problem that I think we're trying to solve together is to solve that problem. But even HubSpot has missing data. I'm in meetings and I'm looking at HubSpotters like sitting in the front. <clears throat> I'm in meetings like on a regular basis with people about, you know, oh, we need to be able to track this. We need to be able to track this. We need to be able to track this. And I think that, you know, as a business, uh, it makes a lot of sense to like work backwards when you think about like where you need to capture data. So like, what do you actually want your customer experience to be? Right? How's your customer going to find you? Uh, how are they going to sign up for your product? How are they going to activate on your product? How are they going to use your product? And then how do you think about tracking those different um, you know, events in the customer lifecycle? And one of the things that we love about Amplitude is it's like so easy to create those new events where you say, like, oh, we just changed something about the sign up flow. We just changed something about the activation event. We just changed something in the product. And it becomes really easy to just add those events in to be able to understand like, who's completing those events. Um, and then with things like replay, uh, you know, it's easy to actually watch customers and see like what they're doing inside the product and like where they're stumbling. And then that brings, then, then you go full circle and you're basically like, okay, if this is where customers are stumbling, this is where we need to be able to track in order to understand like the completion event of all of these different things. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting you say it that way because really this combination, it gives you the power to know. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you the power to know whether your investments are driving the dividends that you want, the outcomes you're trying to drive. It gives you the power to know, you know where there's frustration, where the customers are not succeeding at whatever it is you're building. Are they you know, adding their product to carts or not? Are they um, you know, signing up for the product? Are they sharing? Whatever that activation moment is, you need to know whether or not it's, you're, you're getting that value. Mm -hmm. But you also need to be able to experiment quickly and try out different things and test out hypotheses so that you can, you know, in classic HubSpot yeah. terms, zig and zag along where, where your customers are going. Yeah, totally. And I think it's like, sorry, I'm just going to say one more thing. Go for it. I, I, you know, I think, I think that, you know, especially for product people, but also for, for marketers, you know, we're big consumers of data. I think that you want to think about it through the customer lens. I think you want to think about how your, how, you know, take your, t start with your best idea of how your customers are finding your products and, and, discover, and signing up for your products and activating on your products and using your products and upgrading your products. And then no matter what, you're going to be wrong. Like that, you know, don't feel bad about it. Like you're just going to be wrong. But then once you have that set up, you can learn where you're wrong and then you can continue to iterate and get better and better at tracking the actual customer experience. But I think, you know, everything should be customer focused. Um, and everything should be in service of helping your customers discover your products and use your products better. Yeah. Um, one thing the three of us share as product builders is we all have a deep belief in a concept called product-led growth. <clears throat> I spend a lot of my time advising startups about when's the right time to think about a product-led growth motion versus potentially a sales motion and how to balance the two. Um, Francois, can you describe to kind of all of us, like, what does PLG mean? What does it mean to you and how do you think about using it in a growth over product? Well, PLG, uh, product-led growth, is definitely a buzzy term these days. Everybody's talking about PLG and how can the product help sell, essentially, the, pro the, the product for you. Um, think of it in the standpoint of what if your product was your best salesperson? Wouldn't that be pretty amazing? What if the product could actually help convert and drive the experience that you're trying to drive? And so PLG is not just a marketing channel. It's not a product you know, innovation thing. It's a whole new way of thinking about the role that product can play within your customer journey, within your sales journey. Because if you think about, let's just talk about the buyer journey, for instance. You know, the typical buyer journey looks like more like a funnel, right? Top of the funnel, all the way down to activation. But the reality is that in this new world, customers want more self-service. 
They want to be able to try before they buy. The experience that you deliver uh, will actually enable them to dis decide whether or not this is the right product for them. But every time they're engaging with you, that is a signal. That is an intent. And knowing how to optimize that for the outcomes you're trying to drive is so critical. And so PLG, again, it's about shifting that mindset to making your product the best salesperson at the company and using that to also activate your sellers as well because they understand now all the facets are there. So it's everything around activation, uh, usage, monetization, retention are all the key facets around PLG. Cool. I love that it's making product your best salesperson. You know, Andy, um, PLG is incredibly important for us at HubSpot. You know, with our free CRM and how we can try before. How do you think about? Or how would you kind of explain how it drives product growth for us? Um, I, I mean, let me take a step back for a second and, and touch on some of the stuff that you were just talking about. So, you know, I think obviously we're at, at a conference called Inbound. <laughs> Um, and HubSpot has been a big advocate of inbound marketing for a very long time. And uh, you know, to me, PLG and inbound are very similar because the idea of inbound uh, you know, is this idea that you know, the power has shifted from the seller to the buyer, right? It's like the classic HubSpot story was like in the old days, the sellers had all the information about their products, about their services, and the only way you could get that information was to engage with the salesperson uh, or get some sort of you know, outbound you know, uh, like messaging to you. And in the age of the internet, everything changed, and suddenly buyers had all this information. They could research things for themselves. They could try things for themselves. They could do things for themselves. And so they could get all of this information without having to go through a salesperson. And I think that product-led growth is an extension of that. right? I think you know, for all of us, I think you know, how many people here would rather just try a product you know, themselves rather than you know, get a demo of the product? I think that's just, yeah, most hands are going up. That's just the way that I think people you know, want to experience products. So when you think about HubSpot, we have the free version of HubSpot. We get over 200,000 signups to the free version of HubSpot you know, every single month. And for those buyers coming, or those you know, users and, and you know, future HubSpot customers coming into HubSpot, they want to be able to just, you know, don't just tell me about the product. Like, let me use the product. Let me see. Let me test out different use cases. Let me see if it works for these different parts of my business. And so that's the way that we think about PLG. And are there salespeople here, or is this all like you know product and marketing people? There's like two salespeople here, three salespeople <laughs> here. Um, you know, I think for salespeople, you know, there's this idea sometimes that PLG is going to like replace salespeople, that salespeople are not necessary, and I think that that's not true, because yeah. the way we think about PLG at HubSpot is we want to be product led, but it's not like exclusively product growth, right? So once you have people you know, who come into HubSpot, who start using HubSpot for themselves. Some of them do completely get set up entirely by themselves, buy HubSpot entirely by themselves, you know, and they're able to do that. But a lot of people, after they use it for a little while, they want to talk to somebody, they want to get more information, they want to get some help getting something set up inside the product. And so for us, uh, we have this concept of product qualified leads. And those are the leads that our sales team, that, that, that's the ones that they want. If it were up to them, that's the only leads we would give our sales team is the product qualified leads. And that's somebody who's basically signed up for the product, started using the product, now wants to you know, engage with a salesperson, and they're much, much deeper in the sales funnel than you know, another lead yeah. that they would get. So that's the way that we think about yeah. PLG at HubSpot. And I think what Andy is saying is like really important, which is not, it's not PLG self-serve all monetization. It's different handoffs at that moment, and you, it works in balance with the sales team. Um, he mentioned PQLs, so product qualified leads. I'll have, I'll have you. Uh, how would both of you describe how to think about a PQL, which is a product qualified lead, and how does it relate to other qualified leads? Who's gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. Either on one that. of you. Okay. I guess I'll start. I'll start. So, I, I, like I was just saying, a product qualified lead, you know, so, okay, so the evolution of like different leads, right? So, uh, I'll, I'll say this through the HubSpot lens, but I think this is true for a lot of different companies. You know, in the early days of HubSpot, we just had leads, right? And it was marketing's job to generate inbound leads for our sales team. And the inbound leads would come to HubSpot, they would download an ebook about social media or about SEO or about marketing in general, and then we would take that lead and we would give it to the sales team. And that was great and sales, sales reps loved it. I remember when I joined HubSpot, which was back in like 2009, you know, you talk to sales reps at HubSpot and they're like, I'm never gonna work at another company because every other company I've worked at, I had to go find my own leads and at HubSpot I show up every day and I get leads. And then over time, we started generating so many leads that sales reps were like, I can't, I don't have time to reach out to all these leads. 
who are the ones who are most qualified. So we came up with this idea of a qualified lead. Uh, and so a qualified lead was somebody who was basically deeper in the funnel, right? So there's like a lead of someone who just downloads an ebook, and then there's a lead of somebody who like requests a demo of HubSpot, right? So it's obviously like get back to the people who want demos, you know, the soonest, right? Those are the people who actually want to talk to a salesperson. And then a product qualified lead is like the next version of that, right? right? So now a product qualified lead is somebody who, you know, has not only, you know, downloaded an ebook, not only requested a, a demo from sales, but there's somebody who's actually used the product had been set up on the product in some way, and now is looking for more information about how to get started, how to be successful with yeah. the product. So it's the, you know, the, and then I don't know what the next lead, lead will be, like after a product qualified lead, but it's just, you know, you're going further and further down the funnel to get more and yeah. more qualified leads. He, he starts touching upon marketing qualified leads with this in Yeah, marketing qualified, that's what we others. call them, marketing yeah, qualified yeah. leads, yeah. The marketing qualified lead. Um, Amplitude is incredible at behavioral and product analytics. You know, as you talk about PQLs, how do you think about a PQL? Well, you kind of so need that product signal. What's that? You need that product, product signal. You do need the product signal. I mean, it is kind of the if core If only part. there was a tool that would let only. you track product usage data so that you could get those product signals Tied with for product sales qualified marketing leads. Service and the product. answer is to make it really easy for you. Look, if I told you that I could give you a lead that converts eight times better than another lead, would you want it? Yeah, pretty Ooh. much. So if I told you PQLs convert eight times better than an MQL, that's a hot lead, right? That is that opportunity because the customer is giving you that buyer intent directly in the product. They're telling you what those moments, those value moments are in the product that will then give them the intent to purchase, upsell, cross-sells. But I think it's really important uh, as all of you are, are getting into this journey to know what are those value moments. What are those trigger opportunities to move up? Do you have a value moment? Hold on. Uh, if, if there's a mic for the audience, that would be great. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to hear it all. So let me just finish that thought. Let's get you a mic, and then we'll do that. So they're going to bring that out. Um, so I was just going to say that one thing that's really important is understanding what are those value moments that drive the next behaviors? A classic example is Facebook. Back in the old days of the social, uh, the social world, um, do you know what, what was the differentiation between a Facebook user staying on the platform versus being a lifetime, lifetime Facebook user? Seven friends. That's it, seven friends. So everything that Facebook did back then was to try to get every user to find seven friends. And then they were there for life. We have a customer, uh, Udemy, which uh, does incredible online learning. Uh, do you know what is the highest predictor of a customer signing up for a Udemy subscription? If they want to learn three skills. Three skills. Not just, hey, I'm coming on online and I want to learn about AI, but if there's three separate skills you want to learn, they are going to subscribe. And so what they did is they used that concept, they used that understanding to then start giving offers, <coughs> right, promotional campaigns to say, hey, three, three training classes bundled together at a discount. Uh, they would find cross-sell opportunities in the product, so if you're learning about AI agents, there was another kind of class maybe offered for free to learn about data, to train your AI agents. And so those were really those trigger moments, and they optimized everything around that. Even for us at Amplitude, as we're building software, yeah. as we're building product, it's all about the moment is, did you save a chart, which is our activation moment. That means they got value, they answered a question. As soon as you can do that, then as they navigate the product, we know where they're trying to go next. I'm going to take one clarification question. Yeah. Hi there. Um, my company sells ISO certifications. So we don't have um, a free trial or something that people can actually see the, the product or the service that they're getting. Um, sometimes people come to us because they have to get ISO, not because they're choosing to. And it's not something that people tend to get super excited about. What yeah. could we do for, in the kind of realm of PQLs and you know, trying to, to do something. Yeah. 
rather than just let, kind of let me pull that back too a little bit. We're not we're gonna op not going to open full questions, but I think you're kind of getting to ISO as a specific question of like if you have to find that moment. And then Francois, you were a little bit talking about these value moments or these trigger moments. You know, how do people find what those should be? Um, and then once they have them, how do they think about them in this PLG cycle? Well, I mean, first is you know your product. And I'm gonna actually gonna say the word product broadly because it may be a B2B product, but quite frankly, your website is a product too. You're trying to drive them to take an action. Yeah. Contact us, download this thing. Whatever the action is, think of that as your, your PQL moment or your opportunity to get there. So don't limit yourself at thinking, oh, I'm not a product builder, it's not relevant to me. Everybody's a builder, everybody's building different kinds of offerings. And again, the trigger moment might be services uh, or whatever, and so you wanna use your website to do that. I think it's important to understand, you know, what is that customer journey? Where's the funnel? You know, how are people navigating your experiences that you're putting in place? And where, um, you know, how you look at that journey. If your trigger moment is the contact us button, well, let's look backwards from there and how did people navigate it? Where are those moments on your website where there's drop off? Mm -hmm. So if 100% of people land on the website, but only 7% convert by clicking on the button, what are the steps along the journey that you can optimize? That's really kind of that key. Uh, again, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, at Amplitude, the first step in the journey is to connect to data, right? Either instrumenting HubSpot, instrumenting your website, instrumenting your application. That's our first moment because without data, we can't do anything. Our data upload rate, not so good. It was like 12%. And so we looked at it, we agonized it, we looked at replays, we did experiments, we tried different things, we moved things around. Now we're up to 35, 36%. We did that in a quarter. But we knew what were the barriers in that journey, and then we experimented, we tried, we learned, and we adapted along the way. Uh, but you had to know what you're trying to optimize yeah. for again, and then you work back. You know, Andy, That's you've been thinking a lot about this inside HubSpot as well. Like, how do you find those moments to be fast and easy? Yeah, sure. How do you think about that? Oh, yeah, I want to say a couple. I, I, I want to say a couple things. One, getting <laughs> getting from like 12% to like 34 percent activation is like I don't think it's, I've ever moved the number that much. Before. It is. That's awesome. Crazy. That's incredible. We hadn't optimized this, so <laughs> I'd say the bar was really low. Okay. All right. So that's awesome. And then secondarily, I just want to agree with what you were saying, which is like we obviously all you know work at HubSpot and Amplitude. We're SaaS companies, so we're thinking through the lens of a product. But I think to answer the question from the front, I think if you you know if you don't have like a you know a SaaS product that you're tracking inside of, I think you should think of your website as the product, and then you can use a lot of the same PLG tactics on your website. And if you're using um, you know your, I assume you're a HubSpot customer um, you know here inbound. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with Content Hub and the HubSpot CMS to create like password protected pages, and you can create those types of like login experiences, and even put content behind those login experiences, and then use that to basically you know be the way that someone's getting access to a product. So maybe we can talk after. There's a lot of ideas there, but your website, you know, you can think of as your product in those cases, and you can still measure those flows. And now I forget the question that you originally asked me. I was going to have Andy share. You know, um, finding those trigger moments. Oh, sure. Drive activation and onboarding are, are really key. Um, how do you think about that, you know, even in our team? Um, you know, again, I think uh, you, as a starting point, you can start with your best assumption about customer behaviors, right? So hopefully as product people, as product managers, we're talking to customers, we're watching customers use the product, we're watching replays of customers use the product, and so I think you can start with your instincts there and really say like, okay, this is where I think people are getting the most value of the product, and you can track those things. Um, and then I think to some degree, and you know, you're probably better, than this, better at this than I am, you're probably better at this than I am, but I think there's, a, you know, my honest answer is like, there's a lot of trial and error in, in you know, where you find those moments. When we first launched HubSpot CRM, you know, we tracked a bunch of different actions in the product, and then what I basically did was I looked at those actions and I looked at the retention based on those actions. So you talked about like the seven Facebook users, right? And what you're looking for in that retention, if I draw it backwards for the, for the audience, is like you're looking for those moments like where retention starts to flatten out, right? Like so if retention goes down to zero, you know, that's not sticky. You know, it might not go down to, you know, it might not be 100, it's probably not gonna be 100%, but if you can flatten out at like 50%, you know, retention, that's like a really good re retention point. 
And, um, but again, the thing that you're looking for more than anything is like where does retention start to flatten out, where you're going to have these customers you know, forever, because that's how you're going to stack your user base on top of it. So just as an example, in yeah. HubSpot CRM, one of those things was adding your first contact to HubSpot CRM. So if you add a contact to HubSpot CRM, your retention of HubSpot CRM was really good. And I'll tell a bit of a funny story here. Uh, one of the things I did was I said, like, oh, adding a contact that gets your retention to be, you know, is, it gets your retention really good, but the activation is lower than I wanted it to be. And so I was like, let's run an experiment. Let's just add contacts for people. So everybody comes into HubSpot, everyone has a contact added. Our activation went to 100% because, you know, we forced everybody to have a contact. Our retention went to, like, you know, 10%. So that didn't, that, like, didn't work out. <laughs> okay. uh, and then we kept looking through the data. And, and then the, uh, the next thing that we found was the thing that had even higher retention than adding a contact was adding a team member. When you add the team member to HubSpot, you have, you know, I forget, you know, it was like 70% yeah. retention or something like that at the time. But I think it's a little bit of uh, customer instinct and then a little bit of trial and error. But again, what you're looking for is which of those events are most correlated to retention of people using yeah. your product, or in some cases, maybe purchasing your product, depending on what you're trying to, to buy. But that's the way I think about it. Yeah, I definitely think so. Those uh, moments of retention, it's really understanding your product, that if you do these set of actions within the first set of time, it actually causes like dramatic retention. You, know, you see that in social for Facebook and others, adding three friends in Instagram, for instance, is you know, highly sticky. But what is that moment? Um, if you have data science and other kinds of teams, you can often find those patterns as well. Uh, but you usually have a guess on that behavior. Yeah, we have a lot of so. people at HubSpot who are way smarder than me who are good at finding <laughs> those things with, with data instead of trial and error. But for me, it's <laughs> trial and error. Okay, so if you're not a product person and you don't have a product market, um, what can people learn from PLG? Um, I mean, one thing I'll say, there's the classic expression that you can't improve what you don't measure, right? So you have to start measuring, and at the heart of all that is data. If you don't have the data, then you're kind of flying blind. And so my recommendation is don't, don't boil the ocean. Just get started. Start by just connecting the data that you have and making it available to the people who, who know the business. They could be a marketer, they could be a product leader, they could be a revenue leader. Whoever they are, just start and get that going because once you have the data, you're gonna have more questions. And you wanna be able to start using that data to improve the business. So don't, over, don't overcomplicate it, but start by measuring so you can drive improvement. And yeah, oh, do, you, do I get to answer that question? Go for it. Okay, all right. I'm gonna, uh, so that was, you're the data guy. That was like I'm the, the data guy. Like the data answer. I'll give the customer answer, uh, which to me, uh, and I think both of them are true, obviously. I'm not sorry. Uh, data about the yeah, customer. Yeah, data about the customer. But I think, I think you know, the, 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 to me, you know, whether it's like PLG or whether it's like inbound or whether it's whatever, I think, you know, ultimately all of it is in service of your customer, right? What you're trying to track is you're trying to track what are the things, what are the, my customer behaviors, what are the ways that they're coming to me? What are the ways that they're getting started with my products? What are they finding most valuable in my product? What are they finding not valuable in my product? And again, if you don't have a product that, to, to the question, yeah. you know, it could be your website experience. It could be you know, any of that. And so I think it's all in service of helping the customer discover the thing that's going to help them and going to get them value. Cool. Um, any last advice for folks in the audience? How to think about customer handoff? How to think about anything else? I mean, my, my personal advice that I tell people is, it's gonna sound counterintuitive, but I always say this, care less. Care less about yourself, care deeply about the outcomes. Let's all be outcome focused and let's figure out how to move forward. Don't be afraid by not knowing all the data. Don't be afraid by asking the questions. Ask, be curious, be engaged, care less but care deeply about the outcomes that are out there. And like I said before, right, you can't improve what you don't measure. So measure, 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 experiment, learn, be curious, uh, and incredible things will come out. And, and, and I'll add on top of that, I think, you know, in the same spirit, like move fast and iterate. Don't like, don't obsess, don't get like paralyzed by data. You know what I mean? Like it's all about progress, not perfection. You know, just keep, you know, start doing it start learning from it, and then continue to just iterate and make it better over time. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.